All right, friends, today we are continuing our Back to Life series. In this series, we've been considering the importance of the death and resurrection of Jesus to our lives today. So far in this series, we've talked about how Jesus, through his death and resurrection, uh, makes a way for us to step back into peace with God. We've talked about how through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated sin and Satan and death for us. And he equips us with what we need to step into and appropriate that victory. We've talked about how practically we've been freed from the penalty of sin. We're receiving power to overcome sin in our lives. We've been, uh, and in the eternity, we'll be free from the presence of sin. We've talked about how Jesus's resurrection life gives us hope and confidence in times of trial and suffering. We've talked about how we're a people who can grieve differently. We can grieve with hope. And we've been armed with all that we need to stand firm and resist the devil as he prowls around us. As we open God's word today, I'm going to take us into 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to focus just on the last few verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is a large chapter dedicated to the importance of the resurrection of Jesus for the life of the believer. Uh, I think I've shared with you guys before, I'm now a part of licensing interviews uh, for, new, for new pastors that want to work with the Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, in the Western Canadian District. Uh, so one of the questions that we have the ability to ask is a whole bunch of rapid-fire Bible questions like, where do you find the fall? Genesis 3. Uh, where do you find spiritual gifts? Romans 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4. Uh, Where do you find the resurrection chapter? 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is a large chapter. It's 58 verses, and it's just dedicated to the importance of the resurrection of Jesus for the life of the believer. Uh, As Paul goes through that chapter, he tells us about the certainty of the resurrection. The resurrected Jesus was witnessed by over 500 people. Paul tells us about the necessity of the resurrection. Only by rising again could we know that our sins are truly forgiven and the promises of God are really true and for us. Paul talks about the nature of the resurrection, what it will mean for us to step into and experience the resurrection life of Jesus. And then at the very end, Paul talks about the encouragement and the application of the resurrection, the call to action, if you will. And so let me read 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 58. We're going to focus mainly on verses 57 and 58, um, but I want to read a few verses just to sort of help us get into what Paul is saying. He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this passage good news? Jesus has defeated sin for us. He's defeated death for us. We have victory in Christ because of the resurrection of Jesus. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Still true today. Yes, we say that in April on Easter, but it's still true today. And this truth is not just something that we celebrate on Sunday. In verse 58, Paul gives us two practical actions that come from this knowledge of the resurrection. He tells us there are two things that we should do because of our knowledge that Christ is risen uh, and the knowledge that we'll share in that resurrection life. And so first, because of the resurrection of Jesus and our experience and promise of that life with him, Paul calls us to be strong and immovable. Uh, Verse 58 in this passage begins with a so. It could also be translated as a therefore. What Paul is doing as he begins verse 58 is he is saying, therefore, in light of everything that I've previously written about the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection life that we've stepped into, in light of all that Christ has done for us, we should be 
And B is the verb in this verse. We should be strong and immovable. And way back in verse 1 of this chapter, he told us what we should be strong and immovable in. He says in verse 1 and 2, Let me remind you now, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It's this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Like bookends, verse 1 and 58 call us to consider the good news of Jesus, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. And he calls us to welcome it and trust it and stand firm in it. Verses 3 to 56 were spent proving why we could trust this good news by thinking about the resurrection of Jesus and the invitation that we've been invited into through the good news. And the goal is to come to that place where we are strong and immovable in that relationship. That relationship with Jesus that brings us peace with God, that deals with the penalty power and presence of sin in our lives, that relationship with Jesus that defeats death and disarms Satan. Paul tells us to consider this relationship and grow to a place of confident hope in Jesus. Now, I phrase it like this. Because it's important for me to say that there is room in the faith to doubt things. As Christians, we will wrestle with doubts. I've said before, quoting Dr. Rob Reamer, that the opposite of faith is not doubt. Uh, Faith and doubt are on the same spectrum. The opposite of faith is actually unbelief, and unbelief is a problem. If we look at some of the teachings of the Bible, like God is creator, and we say, no, don't believe that. That that actually is a problem. Because if we have unbelief with God as creator, we won't be able to understand the rest of the Bible. But we can have uncertainty about how God created. We can have questions about new earth versus old earth. We can read scriptures and wonder exactly when, uh, as long as we do it respectfully. There's room in the Christian life for questions. Even in Matthew 28, as Jesus' disciples are looking at him, They're interacting and talking with the resurrected Jesus uh, right before they are commissioned to bear witness to him. Verse 17 says they worshiped him, but some doubted. Okay? Uh, These are people looking at the resurrected Jesus right as he's about to ascend into heaven. He's about to commission them. They're worshiping him, but there's still a whole lot of questions in their mind. Uh, Some of those questions get solved by the filling of the Spirit in Acts 2. Uh, But I just want us to to sort of come to that place where we say, okay, there is room for questions. But where we need to grow in certainty, where we need to grow in confidence, where our hope needs to be increasingly settled, and where we need to grow strong and immovable is in the message and invitation of the good news of Jesus and your place in it. Friends, the good news begins with God. God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He is loving, he is just, and in love, God created everything. Everything we can see, everything we can't see. He created humanity in his image for relationship with him, to know him, to be known by him, to walk in fellowship with him, to care and work alongside him in managing creation. But Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Choosing to disobey him, they fell into sin and death and hopelessness. And in their sin, we all sinned. We've all missed God's mark. We've all fallen short of his glorious standard. And the Old Testament law and our own consciences show us that we cannot measure up. There's nothing we can do in our own strength and power to build that stairway back to heaven and enter into that relationship with God we were created for. On our side of the equation, we can't fix our problem. And an important part of the good news is that uh, even before, uh, or an important part of the good news is that uh, we, is that there's bad news, uh, that we have a sin problem that we can't solve ourselves. To understand the good news, you have to understand the bad news. But the good part of the good news is that even before Adam and Eve sinned, God had a plan in mind, a plan that would satisfy his love and justice, a plan for God the Son to enter our world to take on our humanity, to live a perfect, sinless life, and to die in our place as an atoning sacrifice. 
On the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our stain, all the wrongs we've done, all the wrong things done to us, and he carried it to the grave. As we said throughout this series, he defeated sin and Satan and death for us. This is the good news, and this good news calls us to respond. This good news calls us to action. Paul in Romans 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But what does it actually mean to call Jesus Lord? It means to acknowledge him as God, as king, as the ruler. It means to admit that what he says is true about our sin problem, and it means that we agree with him on the solution. It means that we commit as best as we know how to follow him in obedience, to uh, confess our sin and believe uh, and continually allow him to call the shots in our lives. And each one of us has to make this choice personally. We have to confess Jesus as Lord personally. And then scripture calls us to build our lives on that love and to learn how to follow him in obedience day by day. This is the good news. And Paul says it's this good news and your place in it that you need to become strong and immovable in. You need to press into that relationship with God. You need to invite God by his spirit to give you assurance that you're his child. And as you begin to follow him, you begin to reorient your whole life around this core message. And I know it sounds intense. I know it sounds radical. But the invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to take up our cross, to take up the instrument of death and follow Jesus in his path, learning to obey him, learning to follow him, uh, acknowledging him as Lord. Our confidence in choosing to build our lives on this message is the resurrection of Jesus. This life of following, this uh, life spent taking up our cross is a life that will lead us home. And so we can stand strong and immovable in the good news because the object of the good news, the firm foundation that we are building upon is Jesus, the one who conquered death. And so in Colossians 2, 6-7, Paul writes, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Friends, because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can stand strong and immovable in the message of the good news, and we can build our lives on him. We can grow in confident hope in that relationship as we continue to receive assurance and peace from God. But there is an element of continually returning to that message to stand upon. Uh, so often, we try to do things in our own strength and power. So often, uh, we try to go it alone. We say, okay, God, thank you for bringing me here, but I got it. I, I got it from here. And then we wander off, and then we try to do this life alone. We try to build uh, our own shacks, our own things in our own strength and power, and that stuff doesn't survive. Uh, as I've been walking around my neighborhood, there is this uh, poplar tree uh, that has all these blowdowns from it, and uh, there's all these sticks that are beginning to be formed into kind of a pyramid-like structure or um, kind of a tent around the tree. Uh, and I was asking my kids, I was like, kids, did you guys do this? And they were like, no, we didn't do it. I was like, well, someone did, and it's beginning to look cool right? There's an almost fort happening, uh, and if I were about 10 or 11, I would probably be out there working on it because it's, it's got this really cool shape. But the thing is, in an actual storm, when real rain comes, I would not want to be in that little tree fort area. I want to be in my house with the firm foundation, with the uh, four walls and a roof. I want to be where it's truly secure. Uh, and so often, uh, trauma, uh, life events, circumstances send us running, and we try to build these own little shelters. We try to do life in our own strength and power, and God's continually calling us back, back to that firm foundation, back to that place where we abide, where we let Jesus love us, where we build and stand on that secure foundation of the work that he's done for us, and we move forward trusting that he is with us and for us. Friends, abiding is a big deal. That's how we grow to be strong and immovable in Christ. 
And so because of the resurrection of Jesus, one of the applications, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, is he says, hey, we need to come to this place where we are strong and immovable in that message of the good news, uh, that we are saved, that we are loved, that we are secure. The second thing that Paul says uh, that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus we should do is he says that we should work enthusiastically for the Lord, knowing that nothing we do for the Lord is ever useless. Now, as I consider this verse, there are two components to talk about. First, we need to acknowledge that God does have work for us to do as his followers. We see in Matthew 28 and Acts 1 that God commissions us to bear witness and tell others about him. Uh, We have a job to be about spreading the good news and making disciples. We see in Ephesians 2.10 that we've been created anew in Christ Jesus for good works that have been planned for us long ago. We see in passages like Matthew 5 and 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter 2 that we've been called to be salt and light to those around us. We've been called to be a people of prayer interceding for others. We've been called to be royal priests offering worship to God, not only in words but also in deeds as we live exemplarily, exemplary lives in community with those around us. And so as followers of Jesus, we are called to work for the Lord. And the cool thing is this can happen in every area of your lives. Sometimes we can get into viewing that what we do outside of the church community is secular work. It's regular work. But what we do uh, in church or for church is working for the Lord. But that's not really the way that the New Testament talks about working for the Lord. The the New Testament uses images like being salt and light, and that's a 24-hour, every context type of work. And since God calls you to be salt and light, since we're all individually his royal priests, it means that we can work enthusiastically for him in every area of our lives. As we hang out with our family, as we drive on our streets, as we work at any job, as we interact in our neighborhood, as we play disc golf or walk our dogs, uh, everywhere we go, we have an opportunity to work for the Lord. As we, uh, as we offer thanks and worship Him in gratitude, as we receive love from Him and pass it on to others, as we pray and intercede for those around us, the resurrection life of Jesus calls us to work with enthusiasm to be about the Lord's business. And that business is to be listening to and obeying His voice as He gives us assignments. And if you remember, kids, what did I do? How do, how do we... So how do we show the two commandments? Love God. Love others. And the thing is, as we do this, as we receive love from God, that love can be directed to the people who need to experience that love. And so everywhere you go, as you're receiving love from God, as you're loving Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, that love is just available to be poured out on those around you. Uh, that love is available to be poured out as you're walking down the street, as you're going to your job, as you are, uh, even as you're working, to say, hey, maybe I can just pull over and make a phone call and just encourage someone today. We have capacity, we have ability to uh, work for God no matter where we are. Everywhere we go, as long as you're receiving love from God and standing strong and immovable in that relationship, you have an opportunity to work enthusiastically for the Lord. That's cool. That's a great encouragement. That means that everything that we do is actually holy because God has commissioned us with a holy uh, task. Uh, But the second half of this verse adds something really unique. In the second half of the verse, Paul reminds us that nothing we do for the Lord is done in vain. Uh, None of our efforts for Him are useless. And this is because everything we do for the Lord, uh, it's not viewed from a natural perspective. It's viewed through the lens of eternity. And the amazing thing about viewing things with an eternal perspective is that we really have no idea what our actions and attitudes and prayer and worship, we have no idea how these things will impact those around us. We have no idea how our courage in suffering or our kindness in hospitality, how our tears in godly mourning will impact those around us, drawing them one step closer to Jesus. I remember reading the story of a missionary couple who labored for, I felt like it was, I mean, 
This is a very old, very old story. I, I don't have it. I was not able to track it down again. But uh, as I remember reading the story, I felt like they labored a lifetime in a country, uh, 40 years or more in a place, and they never saw one person come to Jesus. They just kept serving faithfully. They just kept interacting with people. But there seemed to be a lot of hostility, and, and nothing they seemed to do seemed to make a difference. But after their death, others came, and, and building on their life's work, uh, a revival broke out, and many in that community chose to follow Jesus. It seemed like their work was in vain. If you were to take a snapshot at any single moment, you'd say, man, these people are laboring for nothing. But in light of eternity, nothing is wasted God made a way. He redeems and restores. The seeds that are planted may lie dormant for years before springing to life. Our tiniest witness, our smallest kindness, the prayers we pray for neighbors and family members, even strangers can change eternities, and we don't often get to see the whole picture. We often won't see what's happening until eternity. But God sees. God knows. God sees the whole picture, and he is wonderfully redemptive. Romans 8, 28 reminds us that God makes all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And that's why Jesus says we need to live with an eternal perspective. That's why he calls us to store up treasure in heaven, because as we invest in the things that matter to heaven, worship and prayer and people, these are the things that last. These are the things that will echo for all eternity. And so, friends, are you discouraged today? As you snap that camera and look at, at any place in your life, as you look at those things that you've worked for, those relationships that you've pursued, the people that you've prayed for, the ministries that you've been involved in, as you look at that single moment snapshot, as you consider what you see so far, are you discouraged? If so, let me encourage you to trust this promise. Nothing you've done for the Lord was done in vain. God is still working. And if you want me to tell you how I know that Jesus can take even the darkest situation and bring good from it, let me take you again to the cross. Because the cross didn't look like victory. For Jesus' disciples, victory actually looked like Palm Sunday. I mean, Palm Sunday was awesome. Crowds were surrounding them, celebrating Jesus. Uh, worship was happening. Um, the crowd and even Jesus' own disciples were looking for an earthly kingdom. Uh, they were so often looking for a political solution. They were looking for an ancestor of King David to come and rule and reign again like David and Solomon. They were looking for the national borders to be expanded. They were looking for the Romans to be driven out, for worship to be restored. Uh, they were looking for freedom. Uh, there's a spot in 1 Kings, I believe it is, where the author of 1 Kings is describing the rule of Solomon. And he says, in that day, gold was as common as silver, and silver was as common as gravel. It was basically worthless. There was so much money and prosperity flowing into uh, King Solomon's kingdom that basically you're like, yeah, thanks for all that silver, but there's really nothing I can do with it. I, I already have enough. I mean, we might as well just pave our driveways with it because... We don't care. We don't need anything else. We have so much. And as the Israelite people in Jesus' day, as they read the scriptures, as they looked for what was next, that was the dream. Just give us Solomon's kingdom back, God. And as they saw Jesus, they saw this amazing figure, and they're like, hey, I think this guy might be able to do it. I think this guy might be the guy to bring back that Solomon kingdom, to, to make prosperity flow again. And they were looking to Jesus to start a revolution, but the thing is, he never did. He just wouldn't be baited into the polarizing questions thrown at him. Uh, there is a day in the last week of Jesus' life, I think it's the Tuesday, uh, we call it the day of questions because there's different groups that are constantly testing Jesus, trying to catch him in something that they could um, either um, push him one way or the other, or that they could find accusation of him, and Jesus would not take the bait. And then at Passover, 
Jesus sat down with the Passover elements. He sat down with the bread and the cup, and he said, hey, this bread is actually my body. It's broken for you. This cup is my blood shed for you. And his disciples, they, they kind of heard him talk about this, but they didn't really get it. They wanted to talk about who would be greatest in the kingdom. And when they started talking that way, Jesus talked about serving and how he was coming to give his life as a ransom for many. And then Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested. He was tried. He was tortured. He was condemned. He was nailed to a cross. And his disciples ran in terror. Take a snapshot at about 2.30 on Good Friday. Does Jesus' mission look successful? There he is, beaten, battered, bloody, and dying. All around are crowds mocking him. And the only disciple who seems to be present is John. And John and Jesus have a brief conversation. And Jesus says, hey, uh, my mom is now your mom. Mom, this is now your son because I can't take care of you like custom calls me to. And so you need a new family relationship. At that moment... Does it look like there is victory? Does it look like there is success? Only John and some of the women staying nearby. The women actually had more courage. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them. But even on the cross, at that moment where darkness seemed to be winning, even at that snapshot moment, you see glimpses of life, glimpses of victory. Jesus says to the dying thief beside him, today you will be with me in paradise. As he dies, the temple of the curtain, the curtain is torn in two and the Roman guard declares, truly this man was the son of God. But even at that snapshot moment, Jesus is still dead. It seems like hope is lost. It seems like darkness wins. But the reason why we celebrate on Sunday is that that's not the end of the story. Through his death and subsequent resurrection, Jesus defeats sin, Satan, and death for us. Through his death and resurrection, darkness is defeated because that's what our God does. He takes the cross, that instrument of Roman shame and death, and he turns that wooden tree into a bridge that leads us back to God. And so, friends, we can be strong and immovable. We can work enthusiastically for the Lord because we know that nothing done for the Lord is done in vain. Even when we take that snapshot moment and think, hey, I don't think it's working. I don't think this one is successful. We don't know how God is going to use it. Uh, and the very few chances we get to actually see what happens, those are those moments of encouragement to help us to just continue to press on. This is the hope that we can stand in because of the resurrection. This is the hope that we can stand in because Jesus defeated sin and death for us. Caleb's going to come and he's going to play how deep the Father's love for us. Uh, as he prays, um, or as he plays, what's going to happen is he'll start playing. Uh, I'll move the communion elements in front. Uh, and then as he plays and as we sing, I'll invite you to come and grab the communion elements and then return to your seat. Uh, when the song is done, I'll come up and pray and we'll partake together. Uh, but as Caleb just begins to move, I think one of the reasons why it's important for us to be a people uh, who are listening to uh, stories, who are uh, listening to Christian biographies and autobiographies, is, is sometimes we need to see in the lives of others those snapshot moments of where, uh, where God brings more of the story together in a way that we don't see. Uh, we've shared uh, a couple different times the story of, I think it's Robert Mueller. He was a uh, Christian in England in the 18th century. Uh, he had this burden on his heart uh, that, that people in his, king, in his country didn't know that there was a God that answered prayer. And so as he was trying to, uh, to figure out how God might lead him to help, uh, to help see people understand that God answered prayer, uh, God directed him to run an orphanage. Uh, and so he opened up an orphanage in his lifetime. Uh, he cared for 10,000 orphans, but he never explicitly asked for money. He didn't run pledge drives. He wasn't like the PBS. Uh, what he decided is he would show his nation that there was a God who answered prayer by just 
praying and asking for things and trusting that God would move in people's hearts and bring what was needed uh, in order for these orphans to be cared for. And so uh, literally in his life, he wrote down uh, 50,000 prayer requests and then recorded the answers. He got to see a lot in the natural, in the here and now, like, like he's praying at night, at midnight, God, I don't have supper for those kids or breakfast for those kids tomorrow. I need help. Uh, and while he's praying, uh, in the morning he wakes up and a milk truck out front had broken down. And so they bring the milk in to give to the orphans. And then a baker had just baked too many loaves of bread. He drops them off. That's the kind of stuff that he saw all the time. But even a guy who had like a prayer life like that, there were also things that he didn't see answered uh, in his life. Uh, he had some friends that he was praying for, uh, school friends uh, that he just desired would come to know Jesus, uh, and he began to pray for them. And after five years, uh, the first of the friends turned to Jesus, became a follower of Jesus. Uh, after 10 years, the second friend turned uh, and came to know Jesus. And so he just kept pressing in. He just kept praying for these friends by name. Uh, after 20 or 30 years, the, the third friend came to know Jesus. But uh, this fourth friend just seemed to be stubbornly refusing. And, and so uh, Robert Mueller just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. But he died not knowing what would happen to that last friend. But it was at, that, it was at Robert Mueller's funeral that that friend came to mourn for his friend. He heard the good news of Jesus. God opened his eyes and he gave his life to Jesus. Those friends that he'd been praying for, in the end, they were all saved, but it took, it took his whole life and more to see that one prayer answered. And so friends, we need to grab onto autobiographies. We need to grab onto Christian biographies to have that courage again of those snapshot moments that what we do is not wasted. God will not waste uh, those things that we do. We just don't know often what's going to happen. So let me pray, and Caleb's going to come and lead us in how deep the Father's love for us. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your goodness, and we thank you for the promise, uh, the promise of eternity, that we can stand strong and immovable in you because you've defeated sin, Satan, and death for us, even when circumstances here and now seem dark. We can stand in your victory and we can know that there is hope because uh, you defeated death. And we thank you, Jesus, for the reminder that we can work enthusiastically for you because nothing we do for you is done in vain. Even when it seems like our work is broken, even when it seems like, like situations have turned against us, even when we can't see the fruit, uh, Jesus, you see, you know. And you are doing far more than we would ever realize. We thank you for these truths. And as we come now to the communion table, we pray that you'd open our eyes again to see your great love for us. Even as we come to, uh, to receive communion and to acknowledge your grace, would you help us to see again just the incredible love that you are pouring out on us, that we would grow strong and immovable and confident in the grace that you've poured out on us. Uh, we just commit this time to you. We pray for your uh, leadership and your guidance and uh, speak to us, Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.